Dengue fever is the most common and important arthropod-borne viral disease in human. It is transmitted by the mosquitoes of genus Aedes. Two species of Aedes mosquitoes have been identified as vectors of dengue virus. Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. These mosquitoes are widely distributed in tropical and subtropical areas. And most recently, in more temperate areas. Dengue is a serious disease which affects more than 120 countries in the world. In 2019, it is named as one of the top 10 threats to human health by the World Health Organization. Disease spectrum can range from a mild flu-like illness, which is usually seen in classic dengue fever, to a severe, life-threatening disease. Called severe dengue, which is previously known as dengue hemorrhagic fever. And it is characterized by coagulopathy. Increased vascular fragility and permeability. If not closely monitored and managed, hemorrhagic fever is more likely to progress into a state of hypovolemic shock, which is known as dengue shock syndrome, or DSS. Dengue virus belongs to the group of flaviviruses, which contain a single-stranded, non-segmented RNA molecule as genetic material. There are four serotypes of dengue virus have been identified, and several serotypes can be in circulation during an epidemic. Infection with one serotype gives a lifelong immunity against that particular serotype. However, secondary infection with another serotype can cause severe dengue and dengue shock syndrome within the same person. Ultimately, an individual could be infected by all four serotypes of the virus. First let's see what are the signs and symptoms of a dengue infection. Incubation period of the virus is about 4 to 10 days on average. Following onset, symptoms usually last for about 2 to 7 days. Many patients with dengue virus infection are asymptomatic. Approximately, 1 in 4 people with dengue infection become symptomatic. Symptomatic infection commonly presents as a mild to moderate, nonspecific acute febrile illness. About 1 in 20 patients with symptomatic disease develop severe dengue. Most of the time, these patients have a history of a prior dengue infection. There are three phases of the clinical course of a dengue viral infection. Febrile phase, critical phase, and convalescent or recovery phase. Let's discuss about them in detail in the following sections. First let's discuss about the febrile phase. High-grade fever is the predominant symptom in this period. In addition, patient may complain of severe headaches, along with retroorbital pain. Severe arthralgias, or joint pains. Severe myalgias, or muscle pain bone pain, and some people may present with a macular or maculopapular rash, predominantly seen on flexor surfaces. In addition, patient may present with nausea and vomiting, and mild hemorrhagic manifestations, like petechiae, purpura, bleeding gums, epistaxis or bleeding from nose, hematuria or blood and urine, and a tourniquet test is positive in most patients. Let's see what is a tourniquet test in the next slide. A tourniquet test is performed by inflating a blood pressure cuff around the upper arm to a midway between systolic and diastolic blood pressure for 5 minutes. After removing the cuff, the number of petechiae per square inch is calculated. If it is more than 20, then it is a positive tourniquet test. In addition to above signs and symptoms, patient may have anorexia or loss of appetite, sore throat, altered taste sensation, and lymphadenopathy. As patient reaches the late days of febrile phase, fever starts to drop. This is known as defervescence. And it is due to the cessation of viremia. However, some patients may show some warning signs of progression into severe dengue around the time of defervescence. Now let's see what are those warning signs. As I told before, these signs begin to appear around the time of defervescence. These include persistent vomiting, severe abdominal pain, Fluid accumulation in spaces like pleural and peritoneal cavity, mucosal bleeding, difficulty in breathing, restlessness, postural hypotension, hepatomegaly, and progressive increase in hematocrit due to hemoconcentration. The clinicians should always monitor the patients with dengue for these warning signs and must provide with appropriate supportive care to reduce the risk of developing hypovolemic shock. Now let's come to the critical phase. It begins after defervescence and usually lasts for about 24 to 48 hours. Most patients clinically improve during this period. However, some patients with a considerable plasma leakage can develop severe dengue within a few hours during this phase. And in these patients, fever starts to reappear. This pattern of fever is known as saddleback fever or biphasic fever. 
This graph shows the reappearance of fever during the critical phase. Increased vascular permeability is the cause of extensive plasma leakage in these patients. Due to the plasma leakage, blood volume starts to drop, which ultimately results in hypovolemic shock. Due to the plasma leakage, patient may have conditions like pleural effusions, anocytes. And due to the reduced blood volume, patient may have hypotension, tachycardia, tachypnea, reduced level of consciousness, and hemoconcentration. In addition, these patients will show severe hemorrhagic manifestations, including hematemesis or vomiting of blood, GI bleeding, and hematuria, which also reduce the blood volume and ultimately result in shock. Some uncommon manifestations of severe dengue during this phase include hepatitis, myocarditis, pancreatitis, and encephalitis. During the convalescent or recovery phase, blood volume tends to stabilize by reabsorbing extravasated fluid into the bloodstream. Hemodynamic status stabilizes. Hematocrit stabilizes or may fall in some patients due to the dilutional effect of reabsorbed fluid. White blood cell count starts to rise, as well as the platelet count. Now let's discuss about the pathogenesis of dengue infection. It starts when an infected female ED's mosquito bites a person for a blood meal. During mosquito feeding, the virus is inoculated into the blood. Female ED's mosquito requires blood for their egg maturation. Unlike other mosquitoes, they are daytime feeders. They usually bite on the back of the neck and ankle area. Primary reservoir of the virus is human. When an infected person is bitten by a non-infected ED's mosquito, the virus is transmitted into the mosquito and it becomes infected. When this mosquito bites on another non-infected person, the person also becomes infected. This is the main method of viral transmission. Patients who are hospitalized for suspected dengue infection are advised to stay within bed nets to avoid transmission during an outbreak. Because an individual with dengue infection can transmit the disease for about four to five days. Cell and tissue trophism of the virus plays a major role in pathogenesis of dengue infection. Three major organ systems are affected by the virus, the immune system, liver, and the endothelial lining of blood vessels. During a mosquito bite, virus enters through the skin and infects immature dendritic cells, which are located in the skin. Then these infected dendritic cells will reach the lymph nodes. At the lymph nodes, monocytes and macrophages recruit to halt the infection. However, these cells also get infected by the virus. When these cells become infected, they secrete large amounts of cytokines into the bloodstream, which mediate the early, nonspecific symptoms of the infection. Not only that, when the monocytes and macrophages get infected, they are unable to halt viral replication, and this will result in increased viral load, while the host monocytes and macrophages undergo death by apoptosis. Increased viral load will result in dissemination of the virus via bloodstream and reach the vital organs including bone marrow and the liver. Direct destructive action of the virus on bone marrow precursor cells will cause thrombocytopenia and leukopenia. And due to the cellular destruction, patient gets a severe bone pain. And because of its severity, this pain is also called break bone pain. Hepatocyte damage will give rise to elevated transaminases in blood. And due to endothelial cell damage and thrombocytopenia, patient will have minor hemorrhagic manifestations we discussed above. As we discussed before, secondary infection with another serotype will give rise to a more severe clinical presentation than the primary infection. Immunopathology behind this condition is not well understood. Currently accepted theory is as follows. Almost all the patients with severe dengue have a previous history of dengue infection with one or more serotypes. During a secondary infection, T cells produce small amounts of non-neutralizing antibodies, which are directed to the surface proteins of dengue virus. When these antibodies bind to the surface proteins, macrophages and monocytes get attached to the FC portion of the antibodies in order to neutralize the virus and halt the infection. However, as the serotype is different from the previous infection, macrophages and monocytes are unable to halt the infection. Instead, they form antigen antibody complexes and the virus continues to proliferate unchecked. This will result in the production of large amounts of cytokines and complement system activation which are the main causes of extensive vascular effects in severe dengue. And this whole process is called antibody-dependent enhancement. Also, the non-structural protein 1, or NS1 antigen of the virus, can directly activate the complement system. 
which also contributes to the vascular effects. Early detection of dengue infection is extremely important to prevent the patient from developing hypovolemic shock. Therefore, dengue should be suspected in a patient with compatible signs and symptoms and who lives or traveled to a dengue endemic area recently. Patients with dengue infection typically present with acute onset of fever, headache, body aches, and sometimes rash. Nucleic acid amplification tests are the preferred method of diagnosis. Real-time reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction is the technique used to detect viral genomic material in this method. It has to be done within the first week of symptom onset because with cessation of viremia, the virus will no longer available in the bloodstream. Detection of viral NS1 antigen by immunoassays is another reliable method of diagnosis. And it also has to be done within the first week of illness, even though the NS1 antigen presence within blood for about 12 days after symptom onset. In addition, serologic tests can detect the antibodies produced against the virus. IgM antibodies against the virus present in the blood from four days after symptom onset. For the patients who present within the first week after symptom onset, both IgM and NS1 or nucleic acid amplification tests should be done. For the patients who present more than after a week of symptom onset, IgM tests should be done. However, serologic tests may give false positive results due to their cross-reactivity between other flaviviruses, like Zika virus and Japanese encephalitis. Clinicians should be able to rule out those other causes of the same clinical presentation and come to a precise diagnosis. Testing for IgG antibodies is not useful in diagnosing a present infection because they present during life after a dengue infection. Enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA, is the technique used to detect antibodies against dengue virus. Some common laboratory findings of dengue infection include the following. Thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, and mild to moderate increase in serum transaminases. In severe infection, patient may have increased hematocrit, hypoproteinemia, prolonged PT and APTT, and decreased fibrinogen levels. Finally, let's come to the treatment of dengue fever. Unfortunately, there is no specific antiviral drug available to treat this disease. Supportive care is advised to reduce signs and symptoms. Patients are advised to stay well hydrated to prevent dehydration caused by vomiting and high fever. Aspirin and other types of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen should not be used to reduce fever because they have anticoagulant properties. To control fever, acetaminophen and tepid sponging are indicated. And patients should be advised to avoid mosquito bites to prevent the transmission. For severe dengue, close monitoring and observation is required to prevent the patient from developing hypovolemic shock. For dehydration, IV fluid administration may be required. For patients with coagulopathy, fresh, frozen plasma is given. Prophylactic platelet infusion is not beneficial in these patients and can cause fluid overload. Finally, I will give you two MCQs to answer. Pause the video and try them. 